So let's begin our first discussion on ophthalmology and that will begin with an introduction to that subject. My name is Sean and let's get right into this. First of all, let's learn the external features of the eye. Now, the, the word palpebra means eyelid. So as you know, we have two eyelids, one on the upper surface and one on the lower surface of the eye. And the boundaries, the edges where the upper and the lower eyelids meet is called the canthus, the medial and the lateral canthus. And we have our lacrimal gland on the lateral aspect of the eye. It is more lateral to the eye. And in the medial aspect is where we have the drainage system that is called the lacrimal caruncle. We will come into those topics later on. Next, let's look at the eyelids. So what are the functions? It protects and lubricates the eye. What does that mean? So when you close your eyelids, your eyes are protected. Also, it lubricates the eye by spreading the tears that is released. So the tears that come from these tear ducts, they will come and it, the closing of the eyelid is what causes it to be spread evenly throughout the whole system and what helps it to drain. So when you close the eyelid, it causes an even spread of tears across the whole eye and that will be drained through the lacrimal ducts. So let's take a look at the second function. The eyelid skin is very thin containing no subcutaneous fat and is supported by a tarsal plate. So we will get into that discussion soon. But before that, let's take a look at the rest. Underneath and within the tarsal plates lie the meibonium glands. So these are some oil glands. These are sebaceous glands that prevents the eyelids from sticking together. Now, let's take a look at these. So the oily secretions make sure that the eyelids don't stick together. Okay. And if there is a problem, if there is a clogged meibonium gland, that is called a chalazion, chalazion, and we will discuss that as a disease of the eyelids. The eyelid movement. Now, what does that mean? How do you keep your eyelids open? And how do you keep your eyelids close? So first, we have the orbicularis oculi. Let's take a look at that. Here is the, uh, sorry, this is the eye. Around it, we have sheets of muscles. All around it, we have sheets of muscles. This is the orbicularis oculi. And its function is to close the eye. And as you know, it's a facial muscle. From your anatomy knowledge, you should know it's a facial muscle. So it's innervated by this facial nerve, that is cranial nerve 7. Then we have the levator palpebrae, which comes from inside. I'll show you how it comes. So it comes and it is involved in opening the eye. It keeps the eye open. Now, let's go into the conjunctiva, then I will explain all of these in one diagram. So, conjunctiva is a mucous membrane, so that is produced by non-keratinized squamous epithelium. It starts at the edge of the cornea, limbus. So, limbus is the point from which the sclera changes into the cornea. The place, if you take a look at the eye from front, the place in which the white stops and the colored part of the eye begins. So that is, this is the iris and here is the pupil. So that is covered by the cornea and the separation point is called the limbus. Now, the conjunctiva allows the movement of the eye and it prevents eyelashes and other materials entering behind the eyeball. I'll explain that. So, as I said, it secretes mucus. There, there are goblet cells that secrete mucus. And let's take a look. So, it lines the inner surface of the eyelids and the sclera. That is the white part of the eye. So, what it means is the conjunctiva is present here. It doesn't continue along this. Let's take a look at this. 
more deeply. Now, let's start off with the tarsal plate. That's a fibrinous structure. So here's the tarsal plate. It's a fibrinous structure. And that is a place which gives attachment to the muscles. So we have the orbicularis oculi, which is going to be circular. You can imagine all around this tarsal plate, we have the orbicularis oculi. So that is going to close the eye. Next, we have the levator palpebrae superioris that comes from within. So it is inner to the tarsal plate. And that is what keeps the eyelid open. It pulls back, think of it as, let me draw it in a different way. Think of it as pulling back the tarsal plate upwards. Next, let's take a look at the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva originates on the tarsal plate like this, okay. Wait, let me first draw the eye, what is relevant. So the conjunctiva will come from the inner surface of the tarsal plate, it's a membrane and it will come forward like this, sorry. it will come forward like this and go underneath this structure, there is a special structure, it is called the tenon's capsule. Now the tenon's capsule is a thin membrane that envelops the eyeball from the optic nerve all the way to the corneal limbus and separates it from the orbital fat and forms a socket in which it moves. So this is the, the tenon's capsule forms a socket which allows the movement. It separates the eyeball from the orbit and this, uh, there are subcutaneous fat above it. It's, so you can see there's going to be subcutaneous fat and this pr uh, this produces a functional area that can move around without much friction. So here's the mucous membrane. Let's finish the tenon's capsule first. Now, this is a very rough diagram, but basically what it happens is it goes with the optic nerve. It starts with the optic nerve sheath and it goes all the way out. So, now, we learnt about the conjunctiva. Let's name these. So the eyelid is called the palpebra. And this part, which is just beneath the eyelid, is called the palpebral conjunctiva. And this part, which comes more towards the sclera, that is the white part of the eye, that is called the bulba palpebra, uh, conjunctiva, sorry. So why is this important? Now, think of the conjunctiva as a semi-transparent structure which has blood vessels. So it has blood vessels. And if you have seen an eye, you can see these blood vessels. So those will be very prominent during any inflammation. Let's look at this diagram. You can see the orbicularis oculi, which is cranial nerve 7, comes and inserts onto the tarsal plate. And it keeps the eye close. Levator palpebrae superioris, it opens the eyelid. It is from within the tarsal plate. And we have the two conjunctiva, the palpebral conjunctiva and the bulbar conjunctiva. So, finally, let's look at these glands. Now, let's take a look at the three glands of our eyelids. The first one is called the meibomian glands. Meibomian glands, these are sebaceous glands. So they secrete an oily substance. Then we have something called the zeis glands. These are also sebaceous glands. But the difference is, zeis glands are present outer. In the outer side of the tarsal plate is where you get the zeis glands. And the meibomian glands, they are inner. They are within the, the eyelid. And we have a sweat gland. This is a sweat gland, the mole glands. And it is very closely associated with the eyelashes. 
Now, think carefully and try to understand. When there is sebaceous fluid, that is a more fatty fluid, when there is more fatty fluid accumulating here, is it more likely to block this drainage than something which is aqueous? So the answer is yes. A fatty fluid is more likely to cause blockage of these glands. So these two glands, they are sebaceous glands. And here I have drawn the meibomian glands. If you look at the eyelid, so I have to show you from inside. These come and open onto the surface of the eyelid from within. So throughout the entire horizontal axis, you can get these glands like this. So let's take a look at two conditions. One is an infection. The other is a blockage of these glands. So the first one is called a hordeolum, that is a sty. Now, what happens here is there's an eye infection near the eyelashes. It's an acute in infection somewhere here. Let's take a look. So over here, there will be an acute infection. Who's the most common organism? One of our uh, normal flora microorganism, Staphylococcus aureus. So it's a normal common, uh, it's a normally found organism on our skin and it can cause an infection. So when there is an infection by this, there is going to be inflammation. And what are the cardinal signs of inflammation? This pain, swelling, redness, tenderness, all those signs will be present. So it will be a localized inflammation. So you can see this bulging out of the this area. There will be an inflammation and you can get a painful cyst, painful nodule like this. Now, what is the treatment for this? It usually drains on its own. Once our body finishes off the inflammatory process, it will spontaneously drain. The other way to help this is by warm compressors. So there could be a blocked gland that causes Staphylococcus aureus also to get blocked inside and it will cause growth of that bacteria and that will lead to an infection. So if you try to unblock these glands by doing some warm compressors where you take a flannel and dip it in some hot water and gently, uh, gently place it on the eyelids. So that will help to decrease the swelling. Then let's take a look at a cyst that is collagen. This, in this case, there is a painless cyst. So, it's a firm, painless lump. And the cause of the cause of this is because of a blocked oil gland. Like I said, oil glands are more likely to be blocked. So, what happens here is these glands could be blocked. There could be something here or here, and it is blocked. That will cause bulging out like this. So that will cause the tarsal plate or the eye, the eyelid to bulge out. And is there inflammation? No. So it's a firm, painless lump. And the treatment is you can give a warm compress or a steroid injection because it there's chronic inflammation. We'll go into more detail later on. Next, let's take a look at the lacrimal drainage system. This is a drainage system you need to know the pathway of. So, there are some openings here. These are called the punctum. Let me just add that first. Now, understand that this is the lateral aspect. And this is the area of our nose. So you can see from the word, this is where the nasal cavity is. Now, the lacrimal glands produce tears. It's, we will discuss tears in a later chapter and that will come onto the eye. 
it will be deposited on the eye. What helps spread it across the eye? It is the blinking. So when you blink, it is going to spread evenly like this. What happens if you don't blink much? Like let's say you are a heavy computer user. When you use electronic devices, you blink less. What happens then is that the tears will dry up in the surface of the eye. And that can lead to a condition called dry eye. Chronically, it can lead to a condition called dry eye. We will discuss that as another topic. So now we have the, the tears that was spread like this. It is going to be drained through these openings. So first we have the lacrimal glands which drains into the eye via the lacrimal ducts and then it will enter into the superior or the inferior lacrimal canals. Now it should be logical that more tears around 70% enters the inferior lacrimal canal because think gravity. Then this area, this region is called the lacrimal sac. It connects the lacrimal nasal lacrimal duct. Now we are entering the nasal area into the nasal cavity. So what happens is if there is if you're crying, if you're crying, you are producing more tears. That means there's more drainage. And that will come out from your nose. That is why when you cry, you get a runny nose. Now, let's say there's a problem in which there are infants who are tearing more than usual. It could be due to a blockage here. So there's no drainage and the tears will accumulate on the eye and that will produce more tearing. Now, how do you prevent the medicine, the disgusting medicine that once you put it into the eye, you get the taste in your nose? How do you prevent the mouth, nose and the mouth? Because the nose is connected to the mouth. How do you prevent the medicine that you put the eye drops going all the way from the nose to the nasopharynx and in and once it touches our taste buds to cause the that taste that weird disgusting taste so to stop that you can close this part by using your finger this is the area of the medial canthus and you can use your fingers to close that and then the t uh, the medicine cannot enter the nose now let's take a look at the extrinsic eye muscles. There are four rectus muscles and there are two oblique muscles. If you know what oblique means, it means it joins at an angle. Now let's take a look at the function of the rectus muscles. Look at these rectus muscles. There are four. So superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus and the lateral rectus. So what happens when they contract? That is what happens when these muscle fibers shorten? It's going to pull the eye this way. So the superior rectus is going to cause the eye to move upwards. The inferior rectus, when it contracts, is going to pull the eyes downwards. The medial rectus, it will pull the eye towards the medial direction. And the lateral rectus, it will pull the eye towards the lateral direction. That should be easy to understand. When it comes to the superior oblique, it causes medial, it causes inward rotation medially. So medial intortion. The inferior oblique, it causes lateral rotation, that is extortion. We will discuss that when we come to that topic. And the innovations of the eye muscles is very important. So there are two of these muscles which are not innovated by the cranial nerve 3. Cranial nerve 3 innovates all the muscles except LR that is lateral rectus, 
rectus which is innervated by the sixth nerve so lr6 superior oblique is the other muscle which is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve and the rest that is innervated by the cranial nerve 3 so this mnemonic is very useful to know which nerve innervates which muscle of the eye so the lateral rectus is innervated by the sixth nerve the abducens nerve and the superior oblique is innervated by the fourth nerve that is the trochlear nerve oh, and they all join together at this annulus that is a ring like structure let's take a look at this now let's use an anatomy app to look at the structure of the eye first is the white of the eye that is the sclera it is going to be lined by the conjunctiva and at the limbus now we have talked about the limbus so the limbus is the point which the cornea starts this point is the limbus so you can see the limbus here now let's look at the cornea here's the cornea and let's remove it and here's the iris and the middle is called the the opening the aperture is called the pupil and let's take a look at the nasal lacrimal system the lacrimal drainage system is this the medial aspect or the lateral aspect it has to be the lateral aspect so here's the lacrimal glands they will come they will produce its its uh, tears and it will drain through the lacrimal sac and you can see the inferior and the superior lacrimal ducts the canals sorry here are the lacrimal ducts you can see them tiny these tiny lacrimal ducts next let's take a look at the muscles of the eye so here is the annulus of zin this is the annulus of sin it's a tendinous ring and this is the superior oblique the, sorry this is the superior rectus here is the superior oblique here is the inferior oblique sorry the inferior oblique and there's a mistake in this diagram it does not join with the annulus of zin these are the inferior rectus medial and the lateral rectus so guys let's take a look at the eyeball the eye anatomy let me start off with the limbus this is the limbus and in front of it we have the cornea which is transparent that is very important then we have the white fibrous tissue that provides a lot of strength and support this is called the sclera so these two together the cornea and the sclera is the fibrous part of our eyeball next let's take a look at our vascular part so i will start off this part with some projections like this and a triangular body then going backwards like this i'm not sure if you can see the color so i'll change it to yellow that is not the best choice but as you can see this is our uvl layer it has three parts so the first part is the one i just drew this is the iris this is our ciliary body and here we have our choroid this is the layer which supplies the blood there are blood vessels short ciliary artery long ciliary artery those are posterior arteries and then anterior artery which comes from above those arteries they go through this layer and supply the eye 
what does that mean? What is the importance of these arteries? So there's a loop of capillaries. There's a uh, with these projections of the ciliary body, there are loops of capillaries. Now what happens then? These capillaries will secrete fluid. So what the process over there is the epithelia here will release sodium. And then behind them, behind the sodium, chloride ions and bicarbonate ions come. And what happens when those two come? It, this area becomes hyperosmolar and the water will follow. So that will cause the generation of this aqueous humor. And this aqueous humor is present in the anterior part of the eye. And it must drain through a scleral structure. There are trabeculae here. And it will join into a canal called Canal of Schlem. And it will go through the lymphatics and drain into a venule. So this is very important in a disease called glaucoma. Why is this important? Because there is resistance here. There is a certain degree of resistance in the trabeculae. And that helps generate this intraocular pressure which is essential for the eye. But if there is a disease in which those trabeculae are clogged up, let's say there is hemorrhage and blood comes and clogs up these trabeculae, then the drainage is impaired. And that can lead to glaucoma which increases intraocular pressure which can cause damage to the lens leading to blindness. So one more important thing, the aqueous humor recycles. It recycles in this pathway. But the vitreous humor is permanent. It does not recycle in this, like this. Next, we have the retina. That is two regions. So we have a neural layer which is dark and then till you reach the anterior one third of the eye you have a pigmented layer. These pigmented layers are where you get the rods and cones. So this is important to detect light. What is the importance of this neural layer? Now this neural layer will continue along the ciliary body, along the iris, the inner surface of the iris as a black area and it is very important because it absorbs light. So it acts as a black box. It's called the black box effect. It prevents light dispersing like this. Next, let's take a look at the layers a bit in more detail. Sclera, that is white fibrous collagen. Cornea, this is important, is transparent and relatively dehydrated. I will explain the importance of that soon. But first we need to learn the five layers. This is the anterior epithelium. This is the anterior epithelium that faces outside. And there are these microvilli on these cells, on the surface of these cells, which hold tears. It kind of holds the tears and keeps the cornea wet. And this epithelia is a type of stratified squamous epithelium. So they have a high turnover. Every week, they will produce new cells, replacing the older ones. So that means they can regenerate. Next, we have the Bowman's membrane. It's filled with dense connective tissue, but there's no cells. What does that mean? It cannot repair. If there's damage to that layer, it cannot repair. Third layer is called the corneal stroma. It has perfectly aligned lamellas of collagen like this. Perfectly aligned collagen fibers. And between these lamella, you will have some fibroblasts. 
that secrete this lamella. But the problem here is this cannot regenerate. If there's any damage to these lamella, they cannot regenerate. This is important in corneal diseases. And these fibroblasts are also called keratocytes and inflammation of the cornea is called keratitis. Next, we come to an elastic layer because of the presence of some epithelial cells here, that layer can also re regenerate. This is called decimates membrane. And finally, we have the endothelium. This endothelium is a very special endothelium and the problem is it cannot regenerate. It's important to understand that this cannot regenerate. One of the main reasons is there is no blood flow. There is no blood flow. So these layers depend on the aqueous humor for nutrition. So without this blood flow, those cells if they die, they cannot regenerate. What is the function of these endothelial cells? It pump, it's going to pump out the water. Any water that is present in these layers, it is going to take it out and pump it out. So it keeps the cornea relatively dehydrated. It keeps the cornea relatively dehydrated. And it's a easy way to remember these names. It begins from A and goes all the way to E. What happens if there's too much water in the cornea? This is what happens. It becomes hazy. Then, the vascular layer or the uveal layer, it is associated with rheumatic diseases. First, we have the iris, that is the colored part of the eye, that controls the amount of light hitting the retina. What does that mean? It can increase in size. Sorry, it can. It. Now let's take a look at the uveal, uveal layers, that is the vascular layer of our eyes. First, it is associated with rheumatic diseases. Second, let's take a look at each individually. The iris, this is the iris. It's a thin membranous or a diaphragm, it's a diaphragm-like structure which originates from the ciliary body. And the ciliary body is the triangle like so it's a triangle like structure which is a continuation of the choroid now the choroid i will not go into detail it just goes all the way behind as i discussed somewhere over here it supplies blood to the neural layers and the pigmented layer now the choroid so sorry the ciliary body it's very important because it has these capillary, sorry, they have these villi like structures which has blood vessels, blood capillaries. Let's look at the blood supply first. So they have blood capillaries. And this ring is formed by the joining of two arteries the anterior ciliary artery and the posterior long ciliary artery. So when you say posterior long ciliary artery, that means there's another, post there's another posterior short ciliary artery. It supplies mainly the choroid areas. So this is what generates the aqueous humor. Now let's take a look at the muscle attachment. So we have the sclera here and it comes and provides an attachment. It's called the scleral spur, the scleral spur. It provides attachment to ciliary muscles. Now there are three types. First are the longitudinal muscles like this. And then we have circular muscles which go closer to the iris. And finally radial muscle fibers which come out like this. Now. What is the importance of the longitudinal muscles? It provides attachment to the suspensory ligaments. Let's take a look at 
the suspensory ligaments and the, the function first so let me take a new page now here are the muscles these are the muscles of the ciliary body if you are looking at a distant object these muscles are relaxed so when it's relaxed it's at its full length that means these ligaments the suspensory ligaments they are being pulled so this is our lens we have the suspensory ligaments on the bottom also what happens is when these cells are relaxed that is when you look at a distant object these cells the corneal muscles they are relaxed and then when it is relaxed just think of it like this if this muscle fiber was somewhere here when it's contracting it's going to shorten if this muscle fiber was here that meant this ligament is going to be here it is less tense there's no tense it's not being pulled to the side it's not being pulled like this so that means when you look at a distant object the suspensory ligaments are tensed and that will pull the lens and make it thin so that will pull the lens and make it thin when the object is approaching you the ciliary muscles contract so i drew one two three four i will draw four now so now the suspensory ligaments they're close together and now our lens is going to bulge out because it there's less tense there's less tension on these suspensory ligaments compared to the other one so it will bulge out like this so what it means is if you were to remove all these suspensory ligaments and take the lens out this is its normal structure this is how it's going to normally look and this is the way in which our eye adjusts to bringing in light from, uh, from near objects and from farther away objects finally let's take a look at the drainage pathway let's take a look at the drainage pathway of our eye now we have something called the irido corneal angle it is the angle formed from the iris ciliary body sclera and the cornea so i irido corneal angle it is the iris to this cornea so that is where you get these trabecula so this is the location in which aqueous humor the aqueous fluid will come and drain and we have the canals of schlem to take that to a lymphatic system now what happens if there is a blockage this debris cell debris or something it is more common than you think there are macrophages on the trabecular meshwork there are trab uh, there are macrophages on the interstitium of these canals of schlem let me just show you how these canals of schlem looks like with the trabecular network so here's the blood vessel and here's the trabecular network so the trabecular network is where the drainage will happen and if there is any debris if there is a blockage here 
we have macrophages. We have macrophages on the surface ready to attack them. Then there are macrophages in the interstitium of the canals of Schlem. So those help clear away the debris and if there's still blockage, there's another accessory pathway in which this fluid will penetrate through the thin iris and drain through the network within the ciliary body. The blood, there's blood vessels and stuff, there's veins, they will drain through that pathway. The retina, that is the sensory portion of the eye. Let's take a look at that. Now, we have the optic cup and the optic disc. Optic cup, let's take a look. If this is the eye, this is the optic cup, this region. So if there is increased intraocular pressure, that will cause more copying. So what people do is, you can see here. They measure this against the optic disc distance. They check this ratio and it is used to diagnose glaucoma. We'll come to that topic later. And then these are the blood vessels, which is a part of the uveal body. Then we have two more structures. We have the macula. The macula contains a lot of cones and the highest con concentration of the cones is in a spot that's called the fovea centralis so that has the highest concentration of cones and that gives vision so it's called extreme central vision the lens the next topic is the lens it's a biconvex. Biconvex meaning it's convex on both sides. Avascular. If there was blood vessels there, it cannot be colorless. Colorless and transparent. It's and this is important. This has the highest protein concentration of any tissue in our body. And its function is the accommodation reflex, which we just discussed over here. This is called the accommodation reflex. Finally, there are two chambers. Like I said before, this is the anterior chamber. And this is the posterior chamber. So these two chambers are where this going to be the presence of aqueous humor. And the vitreous chamber is where you get the vitreous humor. So I will explain this again. The aqueous humor is produced here. In the ciliary body, there are certain processes which are in front of the lens that will produce the aqueous humor that will circulate around the anterior and the posterior chamber, while the vitreous humor is separated from that and it is present as a gelatinous fluid with high protein concentration.